Can this replace my mirrorless camera? Hello and welcome back. If you're new here, welcome. My name's Sam, this is The Creator's Block, and in this episode I'm gonna talk about the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV and whether or not it can hold up against my mirrorless setup. So a couple of weeks ago, I went on holiday to Kefalonia, which is an island in Greece, if you don't know. Lovely little place, never been before. However, usually when I go on these trips, I take my big camera with me. So in this case, what I'm shooting on now is the Sony a7S III with the 20mm 1.8G lens. However, when I'm traveling, I like to have a bit of diversity. So I do take my 24 to 70 Sigma f2.8 as well. And as you can imagine, with those two lenses, microphone on top, all your little tripods and gimbals and whatever, it it gets a bit heavy and it's expensive equipment to take on the beach, to take on the boat, to just generally travel around with. So I wanted something a bit lighter and easier setup. So mobile phones, obviously. Everybody is using their mobile phone to create content. So I took this phone with me to Kefalonia for the week that we were there to really put it through its tests. I wanted to see if I can do without my big mirrorless setup. Yeah, I wanted something easier but could still produce decent quality content. None of this mobile phone cheap looking stuff where it's all digitally enhanced and over sharpened and it's one over five thousandth of a shutter speed because it's too bloody sunny outside. So it just looks a bit unprofessional, a little bit rubbish. And I didn't want that. I wanted something that can hold up to the standard of a mirrorless camera. Now I'm not gonna say that it's going to replace the camera itself, as in it's not going to outperform my Sony a7S III. I mean, how can it? This is a 5,000 pound setup, whereas this is just a mobile phone, a flagship mobile phone at that. However, compared to like your other mobile phones, but can it produce decent, professional looking results? That's what I wanted to test out. So I took it on holiday with me, filmed in variety of scenarios, so sort of day and night um, at the beach, bright sunshine, evening, took it vlogging, we went on boats, did some slow-mo, took some photos. So yeah, I really wanted to test it out. So we'll see what results I got. So as I'm yabbering on, I'll just overlay all the content so you can see for yourself and whether or not you think it's of a good standard. So why did I choose this particular phone? Well, it comes down basically to the fact that it's got these three cameras on it. If you don't know, it's got a wide angle, 16 mil. It's got a standard 24 mil, but it's also got this very special 85 to a 125 telephoto lens. Now it's a true telephoto lens, so it's not gonna digitally zoom in and give you that pixelated look. It's actually optically 85 to 125. So you're not gonna lose any kind of quality within that range. This along with Sony's UI and its built-in camera apps allow you to actually take full manual control of all those cameras. So you can film uh, one over a hundredth of a shutter speed if you want to, to be able to get that nice smooth motion blur and really make it look professional. They've got color profiles on there. It is really like a bit of a an alpha camera in a phone. So yeah, I wanted to put it through its tests. So the one criteria I had with this phone was I didn't want to, I didn't really want to compromise. And you know how you can get like a an action cam and everybody's like, oh yeah, get an action cam. You can vlog with it. It's so small, lightweight, da 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 da. And then all of a sudden someone puts a microphone on top, a battery bank, all this other rubbish. And then it's like, well, what's the point? I wanted something small, something light, something I could throw in my pocket, take out and start vlogging with, start videoing, start pho photographing instantly. I didn't want to mess about with filters and, you know, microphones and all these other accessories. So I do know that you can actually buy like an external monitor that goes on the back of this. So you can actually vlog, see yourself because obviously all the decent cameras are on the back and the screen is on the front. So who came up with that idea? Right? I, w I do wish that, why can't phone manufacturers just put a little display on the back? Like just a small display. It doesn't have to be high res or anything like that or massively over overly functional. Just a little screen on the back. So then we can vlog because all the decent cameras are at the front or at the back. You know what I mean? So yes, I didn't actually vlog much. However, there is one accessory you can't do without, unfortunately. And that is to allow you to have the nice 180 degree shutter rule. Obviously, I'm in Kefalonia, bright sun, probably the brightest sun I've ever seen. It's like so bright, honestly. So I went on Amazon, probably heard of this brand, 
newer. They do loads of little camera accessories, but this is the only piece of accessory that I took with me to go on the phone. And it was the only compromise I had to make. So here it is. It's a variable ND filter and it just clips on the phone like that over the lens that you want to use. Now annoyingly, it's not big enough to fit over all three lenses. So if you do want to swap, swap between lenses, you do have to shift it around a little bit. And for some reason, I couldn't find a stronger ND filter than this. Not a variable one anyway, and it's a two to 400. However, it was still too bright and too sunny during the day for me to film with at 25 frames per second or even 50 frames per second. I had to put it all the way up to 100 frames per second. In fact, 120 frames per second for the majority of the time. So, so that did restrict me somewhat when I was filming because obviously 120 frames per second, I mean, don't get me wrong, that's fantastic. And it can actually do it over all three of the lenses, which is amazing. But 120 frames per second, is very, very unnecessary for the majority of the time. Also, very, very processor heavy. Your camera has to work extremely hard to process that amount of data. And to top it off, the file sizes are like four or five times as much. So with this in mind, I decided to stick to 1080p because 4K would just not be achievable for a whole week, which to be fair, this is 1080p at the moment. I just upscale it to 4K, little, little hack there. So yeah, I upscaled to 4K because I just don't see the need to film everything in 4K. I mean, all the decent stuff like drone footage and stuff like that and my professional stuff I do in 4K, but this sort of stuff, nah, 1080p is fine or anything that's gonna go on social media, 1080p, you do not need 4K. So yeah, shot everything in 1080p, so bear that in mind, and probably 80 to 90% of the footage is actually filmed 120 frames per second, not 25 frames per second or 30, which I would have preferred because it would have kept the data down. So yeah, phone, ND filter, that is it, no external mics. So I also wanted to test out the microphone, whether or not that was sufficient enough to vlog with. You can probably tell from this clip that it wasn't, the wind was just too much. Like any kind of little wind or hand movement or anything like that just overpowers anything that you wanna to listen to. So my voice, especially my voice, cause it's very, very quiet. The microphone is just not, personally, I don't, I don't like it. However, if you do get yourself in a very quiet situation, like this clip, Carla's having a tough time. She can't get into the water, so I'm just going to try and film her feet from inside this submarine. Let's see if we can find her feet. There they are. <laughs> there she is. Just floating around because she don't want to put her head under the water. What a loser. If you do get yourself into a very quiet scenario, it does actually sound pretty good and it, it does, it is passable. Sam's having his paddleboard lesson. But it's nothing like the external mics you put on top of your camera or this Yeti blue microphone that I have here. So with this in mind, it's not going to provide any professional video and audio replacement to this DSLR. DSLR mirrorless camera. There are a few issues because let's face it, no camera is perfect. First one being overheating. Is it a problem? In fact, no, let me rephrase that question. Overheating. Does it overheat? It definitely, definitely overheats like 100% overheat. And it didn't help the fact that I had to use 120 frames per second almost all the time, which will definitely make this phone overheat. So yeah, overheating is an issue. Is it a problem though? Well, for me, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, number one, if you're filming at 120 frames per second all the time and doing 25 minute videos, then what's wrong with you? Because you don't need to do that. 20, 120 frames per second is for short form clips, like just, just snippets of things that you want to capture in slow motion. So you might do it for the maximum two or three minutes. You're not going to be filming for like 20, 30 minutes in 120 frames per second. It's just not something you would do. However, because I was on this trip and because it was too sunny and my ND filter was limited to 400, well, how many stops that is, I was forced to use 120 frames per second the majority of the time. So it did overheat on me a lot. And I was probably getting max, I would say four to five minutes, depending on where I was, because don't forget I was in 35 degree heat at Celsius so obviously it was already hot um so yeah 120 frames per second I was probably getting about five minutes of footage maximum but it would also bring that warning up one two 
three minutes into a clip. And if you're doing clip after clip after clip, then that obviously reduces and you, yeah, so it is an issue, it is a problem. If I could have filmed in 25 frames per second, I think that this would have been a lot easier because I was able to shoot for about 15 minutes. I mean, I didn't actually test it to see how far it would go, but I did actually make a clip that was about 15 minutes in 25 frames per second. Um, so yeah, I, I think you can film for a long period of time in 25 frames per second. So yeah, the overheating, bit of an issue, but not for me really. It doesn't overheat for anything else. Like, I mean, you can use it to death for sat nav and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't seem to overheat with that, but yeah, the cameras definitely do. Second thing, ergonomics. Now you might think, why are you talking about ergonomics with it? It's just a phone. I mean, it works in the same way as every other phone. Um, well, yeah, you might be right there, but there are a few things that I just didn't get on with using this over using an actual camera. And obviously the lack of buttons and tactile buttons and switches and things like that, you know, is a bit different to a regular camera. However, you have this shutter, like a designated shutter button there, which is great. Um, you know, it allows you to half press and take photos and whatever, which is brilliant. I actually like that. However, when it's in my pocket, if you long press that for a, a second, maybe not even a second, it activates the camera. So I can have it in my pocket and then I'll take it out of my pocket and all of a sudden I've been taking about 30, 40 photos of my wallet that's empty because I bought this. So yeah, that's a bit of an issue. I mean, I don't know how to turn it off. I mean, I did set it originally so that the volume rocker and the power button also do stuff. I quickly cancelled that, but for the shutter, I don't think you can. There's no way I can figure out how to cancel that from auto starting the camera. So yeah, that's a bit, a bit irritating. And I'll just show you some of the features and the built-in camera apps that are on the phone. So we'll start with the photo app. So this is the wide angle 16 mil. This is the regular 24 mil. And then you've got the 85, but then you can also go anywhere from the 85. Ooh, there's the 85. You can go all the way to 125, which I think is about there. So yeah, it's not the biggest telephoto range, but it's very handy. Like I did notice the difference in real life, like out and about, not necessarily in my office pointing at the camera. So yeah, you'll be able to see some footage of it at 85 and 125, see what you think. Now personally, I don't think the quality of the telephoto lens is as good as the other two lenses, especially the 24 mil lens. I think the 24 mil lens is the best camera in this phone, which I prefer because 24 mil is my favorite focal length. And yeah, I'm gonna film most of it in 24 mil, but to have the option to do the other two is fantastic stuff. Now, annoyingly, the app doesn't auto rotate. So yeah, here you have quite a lot of manual functions. So the 24 mil is actually an F 1.7 lens. Um, the ISO, I'm going to definitely bring that down. As you can see, it's far too bright. So you can change your ISO, which is fantastic. You've got various focus areas. You do single shooting, continuous burst, timers, etc. You've got flash on and off. You can change the white balance, which is fantastic. You can do autofocus on and off. It's even got face and eye autofocus. You get the point. It's a very, very capable manual camera. So yeah, back to ergonomics. As you can see down here, there is a lot of that there you can actually lock it so now i can't change any of those settings now because i've locked the screen which is very handy but i've pressed this by mistake quite a lot and i've wanted to change a, a setting like last minute and i've missed the shot because i've had the screen on lock and i couldn't tell and it was just very annoying because you kind of have to hold you kind of have to hold it like this so you're very protective. You don't want to put your finger over the lenses. You don't want to accidentally touch the shutter speed, shutter button. And you can't touch the screen because that's where all the functions are. See, I've just dropped it. Whoa. So yeah, ergonomics. I don't really like this. I just find it a bit cumbersome and a bit irritating. But is it the end of the world? No. So as you can see now, I've actually got the overheat warning turned on on the screen. That ain't good. I think that's because I'm recording the screen at the same time. So we'll let that cool down for a second. Then there are two other video apps that come with the phone and are built in. One is the Video Pro and the other one is the Cinema Pro. If I'm completely honest, I don't understand why there are two video apps. I really struggle to understand why, because the Video Pro app, I personally found more user-friendly, very similar to what I'm used to with the mirrorless camera. The Cinema Pro has some great features in there, such as you can have the Venice picture profile, which is very nice. Um, you can't even have that on the alpha cameras. But then things like I autofocus and whatever, you can, it, it didn't seem to have those options. I mean, it had autofocus. In fact, you could even do like pull focus. You can actually set the top and bottom focus and then rack it through. So that's pretty cool. But that's only on the Cinema Pro app. The Video Pro app, you could just do everything you can do on a DSLR camera. 
or a mirrorless camera, sorry. But you don't have those amazing picture profiles like the flat log, etc. You don't have those log profiles, which I thought was a bit a bit of a cop out. I don't understand why you can't just have one app that kind of does it all. I don't know why you need to jump between the two because I ended up just using the Video Pro app 90% of the time and I stayed away from the Cinema Pro app. Also, the files on that are a lot higher as well. It might even, might even produce better footage. It probably does produce nice footage. However, it's a 256 gig capacity. I've got music on there. I've got photos on there. You know what I mean? I'm not going to fill it up using one vlog. So if we go into the Video Pro app, right, as you can see, again, it doesn't auto-rotate. You've got the record button at the bottom right, which is fine. You've got autofocus, manual focus. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can lock again there. And then your menu here is where you change all your settings. So you can choose which lens you want to choose between. You can choose the 16 f2.2, the 24 f1.7, the 85 to 125 f2.3 to 2.8. So you choose your lens there, choose what frame, frame rate you want. So you can have 120 frames, 60, 30, 25 and 24. And then you can choose the video format, 4K, HD, etc. HDR or standard, slow motion on or off, video light, markers, etc. Image stabilization on or off. As you can See, it's very familiar to Sony mirrorless camera. Then if you go to menu two, you change your ISO, your white balance, your shutter. You've even got, you even change your auto explosion, explosion level, your microphone input, face eye auto detect. I mean, it's, it's, it's well equipped. I mean, for a phone, I mean, that's amazing. Right, so now if we go into the Cinema Pro app, as you can see, it's a very similar layout. However, it does have its differences. So you can choose the frame rate, 128, 25 frames, blah, blah, blah. However, with this, you do actually need to create a project for every frame rate that you're doing so you can't just go in there and then jump between 25 and 120 you've got to actually create project and set that frame rate in that project and then if you jump to the other project that's 120 frames per second you can then continue shooting it it's really weird and really awkward that's kind of why i stayed away from it oh one of the good things actually here is can you see here you can change the shutter to not just what the actual shutter speed is but to 180 degree rule so no matter what frame rate you're shooting, it will always abide by the 180 degree shutter rule. So you won't forget and you won't over crank your shutter by mistake. So that is a really cool feature. And I wish that they had that in the Video Pro app. It would just make more sense. I wish they had it in these cameras. I mean, it would just put it in Sony. Come on, just put it in. So that is really cool. But other, th other things such as your white balance, your focus, your shutter, your lens, and all that, you can do exactly the same as you can do in the Video Pro app. It's just a little bit more awkward. Anyway, I wanted to do some side-by-side -side footage, see what you think of the Sony, see what you think of the Sony. <laughs> right, so I wanted to do some side-by-side -side footage showing you my main A7S III with the 20mm f1.8G lens on there and the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV 24mm lens as well. So how does it look? How does the quality look? Do the colours match? I've got, I've not got a profile on there, I've just got it on standard. I think it's on auto white balance. Uh, very quick um, side by side here, but what's the auto focus like? I mean, as you can see from here, I mean, the auto focus on this camera is amazing. Although this lens does have some serious focus breathing. So if we move over to this camera, how's the auto focus? Is it okay? Is it picking me out? Can you see me? Is it working well? What do we think? I've probably had it on about five minutes. I don't know if it's overheating or not because I can't see the screen. So hopefully when I turn it around in a minute, we'll find out. And it's been on for almost five minutes and it's not overheating. So that's a good sign. So we've mentioned how important the ND filter is during the day because you can't get around that. You do need an ND filter, which sucks. I wish they'd have a built in, but anyway. Now, how does it stack up at night? What are its low light capabilities? I was actually pleasantly surprised at how well it performed during like low light, late, like early evening, um, you know, dusk kind of lighting. Now, how does it stack up to this? It just doesn't. I mean, it, it falls apart, don't get me wrong. But as you can see from some of this footage, the nighttime footage is okay. It's not that bad. For a phone, I think it's really good. But compared to a DSLR mirrorless camera, nah, it, it doesn't stack up. Slow-mo. So as I mentioned before, as I touched on before, it has three cameras, 16mm, 24mm, and an 85 to 125 telephoto lens, which is fantastic. And you can have 120 frames per second slow-mo across all of those cameras in 1080p and 4K. I mean, the Sony A7S III, when that came out, that was like mind-blowing that you could do that on a mirrorless camera. Now you can do it on a phone. I can even do my emails. Plus, having the ability to have all those manual functions, make it look smooth and buttery like a professional camera should. I mean, it's just amazing. So you can really have some good fun with this. And because it is a phone, you're gonna have it with you all the time. So you're gonna be able to whip it out and 
capture whatever moment you're trying to capture there and then. You don't have to think, oh no, I need my satchel, get my bag out, oh no, the moment's gone. Oh, I don't have my DSLR with me, oh, it's at home. Oh, I've just got my iPhone, I'll take it with my iPhone. It does all the automatic functions for me. I don't even have to think, I just point and shoot. Loser. <laughs> Let's not stab at iPhone users. I used to have an iPhone before this. By the way, completely switched to Android from the iPhone for the past 12 years on whatever it is. I've never had an Android before, always had iPhone. And I gotta say, I prefer Android. Did you hear that? I prefer Android. I just think it's a better operating system. Google Photos and Google Drive and the way that everything works together is just so much better than iPhone. I mean, have you tried to use iCloud? It sucks. Moving to an Android, it's like having a little mini computer. Love it. So yeah, I'm always gonna have this in my pocket. So I'm always gonna be able to capture some amazing footage with this. I don't need to have this all the time. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to take it many, many places. But this is going to be with me the majority of the time and I'm going to get some awesome stuff with it. It also makes me want to shoot more as well because I've started doing TikToks and blooming Instagram reels and stuff like that. I didn't bother when I had an iPhone because I just didn't like, I didn't even use the camera on the iPhone. I just basically took pictures of coffee and, and, and my food and then I didn't do anything with it. Now, the big question is, will it replace a mirrorless camera? No, I've already said that in the video, I think. But no, it, it won't replace that. And if you want him to replace it with the this, then I don't think you can yet. Photo wise, definitely not. Like it just does not stack up. I mean, you can create some really nice images for like Instagram or, you know, short term content, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But if you're going to use it professionally for like product photography or portrait and stuff like that, then no. But for some very nice images and very nice photos that you want to show off to your friends and to your family and online and whatever, then yeah, it, it, it creates some good stuff, but it cannot replace this camera and it will not replace this camera. So with that being said, it is definitely going to stay with me because I mean, it's my phone now, but other than that it's going to be my B camera where I want to create some secondary footage alongside this camera and definitely in my opinion the best camera phone on the market just in terms of flexibility and what you can do with it not necessarily the image quality itself because iPhones are like and even Samsung and Pixel I mean the image quality from those phones is amazing however they're not as well equipped as this. This is just, I love it. Right, it's just great. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps out the channel. Also, if you want to see more videos like this, consider subscribing, hit the bell, all those nice things, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Also, I've got myself a cool little case. You can put it on there like that. It's a case it says Sony on the back of it. But also, it's got a billion stand. How cool is that? So I can like rest it like that, rest it like that. And that's just pretty cool. I mean, you can probably get that for iPhone as well, but yeah. right, it's new to me, new to me. It's got my eye over my eye. <laughs> so it's a twin eye autofocus there. So Sony can do eye eye autofocus. I mean, that's impressive.